الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فعوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما نقم منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا مثل المؤمنين مثل المؤمنين في توادهم وتراحمهم وتعاطفهم كمثل الجسد إذ اشتكى عضو منه تداعى له سائر الجسد بالسهر والهم أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Alhamdulillah, first of all, we give praise and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we express our gratitude to Allah and thanking Him for all the blessings and the favors He has given to us. For indeed, Allah is the one who continues to provide us for each and everything that we have, what we need, and what we will continue to need, and what we will continue to have on the face of the earth from Allah, that comes only from him and from no one else with his decree and his judgment and with, with his wanting to give us that. Nobody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith I have quoted in the beginning, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, it is a beautiful tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that gives us a wonderful teaching about our own selves. And uh, we as Muslims must take the lessons from these things and put it into our lives and practice upon it because uh, they are teachings for us. The Prophet ﷺ spoke and his words were jami, comprehensive words. Few words, but the meaning, Allahu Akbar, is filled with meaning that we can use for every time. When he said something to the Sahabas, they took it, practice upon it at their time. And those who came after them practice on the same thing with respect to the times and the environment they lived in. And in every different time and every different period, even though our environment will be different, even though the way we live might be different with respect to what we have and where we are situated on the face of the earth, the words, the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will always be relevant at all times. It will always be suitable for all times. And with, it will always fit into the environment and the place we live in at all times. So it means that just like the teachings of the Quran could never be outdated, so too the beloved teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could never be outdated. So nobody can say, and it is unbecoming for any Muslim to think, far less for saying, that the teachings were confined to the people who lived in Mecca and Medina or in Saudi Arabia because that was their custom and their culture and that is what belonged to them. That, was, that is what was suitable to them. So it belonged to that place alone or the Middle East or it belonged to that age, that time. We are living 1400 years away. You know, and it's not for our time, no. Other people's statements may become outdated. People's statements, their decree, their judgment, their decisions may be suitable only for a certain place at a certain time. But that is not so with the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is why before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left this world, he said in the hadith recorded by Imam Tirmizi, I am returning back to Allah. I am going back to Allah. And this he said to his whole ummah, his entire ummah. I am returning back to Allah, but I'm leaving two things behind me. Two things behind me. You will never ever go astray as long as you hold on to these two things. Subhanallah. He spoke to those who were there with him. He also spoke to those who will come 100 years after 
also to those who will come 1,000 years after or even 10,000 years or 100,000 years after, these words will be for everybody. That in every period, the customs, the culture, the language of the people will change. But as long as Muslims hold on to these things, the Prophet wasallam guarantees that they will never ever go astray. And if we look through the pages of history, from the time after the Prophet wasallam until now, those who went astray, those who have gone astray and are going astray, it is because of the fact that they have left out one of these two things or the boat. They have either left out the teachings of the Holy Quran from their lives. So if they can leave out the teachings of the Holy Quran, what should you say about teach, leaving out the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ? When the Holy Quran, it is the revealed book from Allah, the revealed words of Allah, the final scripture and revelation on the face of the earth, and the first primary source of Islamic teachings. So whosoever leaves off the teachings of the Quran will leave off everything. And then there are those who went astray because they have left out the way of the Prophet or left out the teachings of the Prophet while claiming to hold on to the Quran. But this will be a false claim. Why? Because if anybody says that we will hold on to the Quran alone and not the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, well, in the very Quran, you are told to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how can you be true in that claim? If anybody claims, and we do have a group of people who is known as Munkirin al-Hadith, rejectors of the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is a group of people who clearly say, and they boldly say it also, we have no need for the hadith. The Quran is there. Allah has revealed the Quran. Doubts are created in the, in the hadith, but there, there isn't any doubt in the Quran. But again, this is just the front. Made, self-made arguments to justify something. But the, because the same tongue that recited the Quran is the same tongue that recited the Hadith. So on one hand, how did we get the Quran? It came from the Prophet So on one hand, what he recited from the Quran, a person is saying that's correct. But with the same tongue that recited the Hadith, we say, okay, that's wrong. It doesn't make sense. Then those who transmitted the knowledge of the Quran from the Sahabas were the people who, the same people who transmitted the knowledge of the Hadith. And in the second generation, the Tabi'in, those were the same people who transmitted the knowledge of the Quran and the recitation of the Quran. So there are two things about the Quran. One is the words of the Quran. They are directly the words of Allah. There is no doubt about that. There has been no change in those direct words. They are recited words that were recited by Jibra'il directly to the Prophet And how the Prophet recited it, that's how the Sahabas recited it. And how the Sahabas recited it, that's how the second generation recited it. And how we recite Surah Fatiha, that was the same way it was recited 1438 years ago by the Prophet they were the very sad people who transmitted the words of the Prophet ﷺ. So how it is possible that the same tongues have made mistake in this one, but they haven't made mistake on the other one? It's ajeeb. It doesn't make sense. So there is a, a group, a fitna group, the mischievous group, which are present in many different parts of the world, who call themselves munkirin al-hadith. The rejectors of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Their claim is the Quran is sufficient for us So they don't take to Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam There is a possibility This is their argument You know that there can be errors 
But it's the same people who transmitted the Qur'an, the same people who learned the Qur'an and disseminated the knowledge of the Qur'an. May Allah protect us from that fitna. And that fitna comes in different ways. That fitna, sometimes that mischief might not be coming from a person who belongs to a certain group that calls themselves that, but this tendency might enter into the mind and the heart of even the innocent Muslims. So if a person comes and he starts to argue, what he says may make sense to you. And he may put you to think. And he may put you to think and he will say, you know what you say, it makes sense. You know, so many words, who will remember so many words? But the same question can be asked. Who can remember thousands of ayats of the Quran? So the same argument can be put for that also. So therefore, this is what, so therefore, that may come over to an innocent Muslim, not paying attention to the trick and the fitna that is there in the words. And he may develop the tendency now to one, reject the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One, that's the first stage. If not that, he will become doubtful about the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when a hadith is being quoted, even though all the scholars, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, have stated it's authentic, he becomes doubtful. He says, I still have doubt. You know? So this is a fitna that actually shaitan, you know, with his help, is moving to the minds of innocent Muslims. And though you will find that Muslims are living together, but sometimes people develop different ideologies at times because of the fact that these are new ideologies and deviated ideologies either coming from Shiaism or Qadianism or some people who deny and reject the ahadith of the Prophet This is why it is always important for us to be conscious of what we hear, where it comes from, and ensure that we are not hearing something that will cause our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be affected, or our Islam that we practice, it actually it starts to be affected. Because our entire religion of Islam is based, first of all, on our aqidah and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one can take to the other, and then that can begin to corrupt the what? The heart and the iman in the heart. May Allah protect us from that fitna. The hadith, getting back to the point, the hadith that I quoted uh, before, hadith recorded by Imam Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us a very important thing. And he said, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادِهِمْ وَتَرَاحِمِهِمْ وَتَعَاطِفِهِمْ He says, uh, the similitude or the likeness of all the believers together, all the believers, with respect to their love for each other, with respect to the mercy they have for each other, with respect to their care, their leniency and compassion shown to each other, how they live together, he says, كَمَثَلِ الْجَسَدِ It is exactly like the human body. How does the human body operate? He says, If any part of the human body becomes sick, falls sick, or begins to complain of pain, The entire body rushes to that part of body with actually wakefulness, sleeplessness, and also fever, subhanallah. Two important things we need. There are many lessons to be learned from any given hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because the Prophet himself says, he said, "Utitu jawami ul kalim." Allah has blessed me with comprehensive words. Two words the Prophet says, and you will find volumes have been written, just like that one hadith. Inna mal a'malu biniyat. Volumes have been written about that hadith. The meaning, the message, actions are judged by intentions. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ad-deenu an nasiha Religion and Islam is about giving good advice and taking good advice. Subhanallah. Volumes have been written because he has been given as a gift by Allah comprehensive words. One word he uses, subhanallah, and the meaning and the message and the lessons that are learned. So he said two important things from among the many things. 
He tells us, first of all, how we as Muslims supposed to be living with each other. How we are to live with each other. The Muslim is a whole community. It is a community, a brotherhood that Allah has himself joined together. Allah reminds us in the Quran. Obviously, the Quran was first of all revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahabas were around him. So the first and immediate address would have always been those people. And those people before Islam came, they lived in tribes. And the tribes fought against each other. There were many tribal wars. Tribal wars continued for centuries and it never ended. There were always fights for small petty issues. There was no unity, no peace, no harmony, no protection being rendered, given by one tribe to the other because they were warlike people living, battling with each other day and night. This was the environment. Each had his own part. They fought. And that was a, a normal thing for the Arabs at that time, living in Makkah and Medina. So Allah said, before Islam, you were living like enemies. Slitting the throat of each other. Fighting each other. And with your actions being on kufr too, you were actually on the brinks and the edge of the fire of hell, ready to fall into the fire of hell. But Allah sent this deen Islam. And Allah sent his Nabi, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he brought you, while you were on the brinks, ready to fall in, he brought you out of the air, from there. And you know what he did? He joined you into one brotherhood. So that you became brothers through the ni'mat and the favor from Allah. You couldn't do that on your own. You saw each other as an enemy. You saw each other as a person who wants to kill you. You saw each other not as a friend. Even family members who were divided based on tribalism, they could not see eye to eye. Belonging to a tribe was more important than even blood lineage based on the tribe you belong to. You found yourself fighting against each other. Sometimes, like the Sahaba said, we just, at that time, before Islam, we just didn't know why we used to fight. SubhanAllah. It was when the call was made by the leader of a tribe, everybody had to join in. They lived like that. Allah says, look, where you were. And Allah said to the Prophet, O Prophet, if you alone would go ahead to join everybody into this one brotherhood and bring love in their hearts for each other, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. And Allah said to the Prophet in the Quran, لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْعَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا لَفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ If you were to spend, and if you had spent the whole world, the wealth of the world, and whatever it contains to join the hearts together and to bring the people into one brotherhood and make them understand that they are brothers to each other, living in peace and harmony. Oh my prophet, you couldn't do that. But it is Allah and Allah alone who joined the hearts. Allah who created the hearts joined the hearts. Subhanallah. That is what Allah did. So therefore, from that, alhamdulillah, the Muslims continued. Though they were enemies, they continued to live in such a brotherhood that they give their lives to protect the other one, subhanallah. They could not see another one suffer. They could not see another one starve or hungry, subhanallah. And this came down until, alhamdulillah, Muslims in every century, when they accept Islam, or they are born as Muslims and grow into Islam, this is something that we learn naturally, that we are brothers to each other. We look out for each other. And that is exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying in this hadith. You as Muslims, we as Muslims, he's saying, with respect to the love that we have to show for each other, with respect to the mercy and the compassion we have to show to each other, with respect to that care and attention and concern we have to each other, have for each other, it is just like a human body. How does the human body operate? Subhanallah. And this is why he used it to make it look and say that the way you behave with each other in this regard and this respect is just like the human, human body. You have a body. We all are human beings. If a part of your body is with pain, even the finger, the human body is connected in such a way that that pain is expressed by the tongue. The pain that one finger feels 
it's ex expressed by the eyes. Tears starts to flow the, from the eyes. The whole body starts to get fever. Where is your pain? In a toe. Where is your pain? In one tooth. Where is the pain? In one finger. Where is the pain? Just beneath the fingernail. But the whole body is suffering from fever, subhanAllah. The whole body is rushing to help that little small, little tiny limb, Allahu Akbar. The whole body is rushing to see that small cut that a toe got and you are bawling and screaming and thinking that you are suffering the worst, subhanAllah. The whole body is uneasy. The Prophet says you can't sleep, the whole body can't sleep because one part of your body is, is, is suffering from pain. One part is troubled, one organ is troubled and the whole body is restless. Subhanallah. The Prophet says that's the ummah. That's how the Muslims live with each other. When one person suffers, the whole Ummah rushes to his help. When one person suffers, the whole Ummah rushes and they become concerned. The parts of your body are not selfish, subhanAllah. When your finger is paining, or the toe is paining, or any small part or limb is paining, your eyes will not say, you suffer for it on your own, I will not cry for you. The eyes will begin to throw tears. That's the connection. Your eye, nothing's wrong with your eye. Sometimes somebody see tears coming from your eye and say, what's wrong with your eye? You're suffering something. He says, pain boy, pain. Can't bear it. Nothing's wrong with your eye. But when he sees tears coming from the eye, he thinks something is wrong with your eyes. He says, what's wrong with your eyes? You say, pain. The pain might be in the foot. Subhanallah. That's how the body is connected. And that's the, the Prophet says, that's how the Ummah ought to deliver. The, since each part of the body does not behave in a selfish manner and does not operate in a, you know, being single by itself and dis detach itself and disconnect itself from the other part, you know, like one part will say, I will not share in your pain. I will not express your pain. You suffer on your own. So to the Muslim Ummah, it does not behave like that. Subhanallah. But we feel for each other. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, with respect, the love, with respect to the love that you have to show to each other, it must operate like the human body. That showing that love to each other, with respect to the mercy that you show to each other, it must operate like the body subhanallah one part is ailing the other part will subhanallah treat it so nice it will squeeze it it will massage it it will take care of it one part taking care of the other part subhanallah one part of the ummah taking care of another part of the ummah that's the whole ummah working together subhanallah so therefore when we look at that hadith carefully, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us how we as Muslims are supposed to live, how we should be living. And a very important lesson that we learn from that, that beautiful tradition, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has asked us and told us how we should live is that a Muslim, any Muslim, whosoever that Muslim might be, male or female, every single person, we must never be selfish in our thought and our behavior and our actions. In our feelings, we should never be selfish. In other words, we must never ever develop the tendency that other people are harmed, other people are troubled, other people are suffering, other people are in need, and we develop that tendency to say, let them say about themselves, yes, Alhamdulillah, I am not suffering. No, no, no. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried in his dua, he said, Ummah, Ummah, mine Ummah, my nation, my nation. He cried day and night for his Ummah. And on the day of judgment in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, he will be crying for his whole nation, subhanAllah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never worried for himself. He never asked for himself. He asked for the poor and the needy, subhanAllah. He asked for them. He undertook troubles and pains for his ummah, subhanallah. Not for his own self. For days, whatever he got, subhanallah, look at this. 
Wealth will come into Islam after certain cities were conquered. The wealth of Bahrain, according to the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari, it came so much, so much gold coins came. The people were paying their jizya tax, the people were paying their sadaqat, and it was thrown into the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after Fajr Salah, he sat there, there were heaps of gold coins there, their currency was gold coin and silver coin. And he sat there and he did not move from that spot until he distributed the last gold coin. When it was totally empty, then he left the masjid to go home. When he went home, there was nothing to eat. Days passed and there was nothing to eat. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to tie stones in his belly and stomach. He will go to the house after Fajr. He will say, oh Aisha, is there anything to eat in the house? Aisha will say, oh Prophet of Allah, there is nothing. Then he will say, okay, well I am fasting today, subhanallah. This is what. He gave out every single thing. He was not concerned about himself. He was not worried about himself. He kept nothing for himself, subhanallah. Absolutely nothing. He kept for himself every single thing he gave so that the people will have. So that those who are poor and needy, those who are less fortunate, those who are troubled, those who are suffering, that they will have also. So therefore, he is our prophet. And this is the teaching he left for us. And this is the teaching he told us to have and to implement and keep that we must never become selfish people. Why do you think we give zakat? We work every day for the money. Subhanallah. A man could say, this is my money. I could spend it how I want. Allah says, no. That money belongs to Allah. Every year you have the nisab. Remember the poor and the needy and the others. Give your money in zakat. Every Ramadan we have to give sadaqatul fitr. Ever so often we hear a call. The masjid is being built. Such a place needs the money. Such a person is in trouble. We are always called upon. Subhanallah, all these are different trials and tests from Allah to see how we will act towards his deen, how we will act towards each other, how we will behave towards each other. Will we become selfish, keep what we have, die with what we have, and then account to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we must think about other people. We must feel hurt just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to feel hurt for other people. Just he had, he had that fikr and worry for everybody, that worry for everybody. So too we should have that concern and worry. And develop such a heart that we will never ever be such a people that we are thinking about our own comfort, our own luxury, our own goodness, our own everything. But we become people who will be caring also. We'll be thinking about other people like how the body operates, subhanallah. And my dear beloved brothers and sisters, you know, in this time and day, Muslims throughout the world are suffering, inna lillah. They are suffering in one way or the other. You know, many people are suffering, but there is a very, very close attachment the Muslims among themselves. That's a special attachment. And it's about that Allah mentions in the Quran. And it's about that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in this hadith. The way we behave to each other. And at present, many of our Muslim brothers and sisters are being killed. We know about the incident. We know about the incidents and the situation that is taking place right now in Burma. In Burma, where Muslims are being, thousands are being killed daily. That even the UN and even the Turkish government, even the Turkish Prime Minister have called it genocide of the Muslims. Those of us who are aware of what is happening, thousands of people, our Muslim women are being raped, our children are being killed. The Myanmar military comes in to Regenia. It's a place which is filled with Muslims, thousands of Muslims. Their parents and four parents had settled there. Just like how our parents came from India and settled here. So we are here. The land also belongs to them. They are kicked out, but they are killed. They are slaughtered like animals. The military will come in. Eye reports, witnesses, the news that are transmitting. Such information makes it very clear. They will tell these people, the Muslims, come out from it. Stay inside their house. Do not come out. And when they stay inside the house, their houses are burned down. And when that happens, if they rush out, they are shot. 
They are taken, slaughtered, and tortured to death, subhanallah. That is the present situation, my dear brothers. They are all Muslims. All Muslims. There are other ethnic groups living right there. Nothing is done to them. Nothing is done to them, subhanallah. It's sad to know that we don't see this in many of the international media house or media. We don't see it. Other things are shown. One person is killed in a certain place. All the media house will cover that. Thousands of Muslims. Families are slaughtered and killed one after the other right in front of the eyes of the father and mother, subhanAllah. 70 to 80,000, in fact, so far over 100,000 people have fled to move to the close by land in Bangladesh. But you know what? When they are on the border, they are shot with machine guns and they are killed right there. They can't even go over also. It's a terrible situation right now in Rohingya. Extremely terrible. Genocide. The UN nations have called on the government, the Myanmar government, to look into it, to look into it. Nothing is done. And day and night, Muslims are suffering right now as we speak. Subhanallah. And if you see some of the pictures of the gruesome killing, it's not just shooting. Swords, daggers, knives are taken and the truths are slit and cut off. Subhanallah. My dear brothers and sisters, based on that hadith, we cannot be selfish. We can't just think about ourselves. We have to think about our brothers and sisters. While we live in Amman, safety and protection, what is really happening to those who are connected it with us in a connection that is stronger than blood, the connection of Iman, the connection of feet. Yes, there are many things we can't do. We are handicapped in many ways. But dua, which is the most powerful weapon, we can do that. And that is exactly when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Mac Medina from Makkah, there were some people who could not undertake the migration. They were too old. They couldn't undertake that trip, ride on a camel for so many hours. Very old people, old men and women, and little children who could not. They remained in Medina. They remained in Makkah, sorry. And because the Muslims had already migrated, the Quraysh of the Makkah started, to, Makkah started to take advantage, beat them, tie them, beat them until they became unconscious, dip their head in cold water hoping they will die, putting them lying on the ground and throwing hot burning charcoal, punishing them day and night, pay for what your friends have gone, done. They have migrated. They couldn't reach the Prophet. Those were the days. Who will go? If anybody tried to escape from Makkah, they were killed on the way. They made dua to Allah. Oh Allah, inform your Prophet of what we are going through. Inform your Prophet. Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet and informed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet raised his hand and says, Rabbana akhrijna, oh Allah, take, take out. These poor and needy Muslims who are suffering, oh Allah, find a way out for them to come out from the persecution and the torture. Allah created a way. And within a few days, they were in Medina, subhanAllah. That's what the Prophet taught us. He couldn't. He couldn't go back. Their lives were at risk. They migrated overnight. We know he had to hide to migrate. They looked for him all over the place. He had to go in the cave and hide for three days and three nights. So they couldn't go. What, worked, what, what, what actually brought the miracle that do us? So if we... That's the only thing we could do. Let's remember our brothers and sisters day and night. The thousands who have been slaughtered like animals. Only for what? Because they are Muslims. Get rid of the Muslims. And you know very well, those of us who are aware of the politics of the day, they are mighty powers behind the slaughtering of innocent Muslims. To get rid of the Muslims wherever they live. And that continues all over the place. We are not blind. The Prophet ﷺ says, the Muslim sees with the light given to him by Allah. He sees with a firasat, not only with the physical eyes, he sees deeper than that physical eyes. Subhanallah, we must make dua, each and every one of us. Whenever we make dua, we perform salat. Every time we make dua, remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering 
only because they are Muslims. This is why Allah says, those who were, had to suffer in the past, those who were killed in this manner, what wrong did they do to people? Allah says, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيبِ There was no wrongdoing on their part, except they choose to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that was the fault. They choose to believe in Allah, and that was the wrongdoing that they were killed for, subhanallah. So let us always remember them and do whatever we can. Whenever we see our dear Muslims suffering, make dua for them. Do what we can to help them. Obviously, we have to help anybody who is in need. But based on the hadith I have quoted, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has taught us how we live among ourselves, how we behave among ourselves in light of this, this is something we should always keep in mind. And we should never be about my own self, my own self. Okay, I am happy, I am good, nobody is interfere with me, nobody knows what the tomorrow has in it. Nobody knows what can come to us in the future where we will need the help of other people. Today we are living safe. Allah alone knows what the future has. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect us. May Allah, we beg Allah to bring ease to our dear brothers and sisters wherever they are on the face of the earth protect them from what is happening and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take them out from this zulm and oppression and tyranny that they have to meet and they are confronted with wal akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin saw his face so beautiful